good to have you all this this morning, this afternoon. Um, for those of missed the, the those of you who missed the morning service for, for a minute, I thought Pastor hacked into my iPad and had a look at my message. So some of the things I will share with you, he has shared already. Hallelujah. Um, so so I, I, I named this uh, this message. Um, how did he get to this? It's, it's, it's all a question. It's so it's all a muddle. It, it will make sense in the end. I I don't hope I know. It will make sense in the end. But but, but it's all a question. Just have that in mind. How did how did you get to this? How did it get to this? Hallelujah. So I wanted to I want us to decipher the the extravagant love of God. But it's impossible to mention the love of God without mentioning the grace of God. And I know you know that it's impossible to talk about the grace of God without talking about the law of God, the law of Moses, whatever you, 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 know, you call it. Because it's, it's impossible to understand the grace until you understand the law. So the law, the Ten Commandments, is not the complete law when someone says the law. In fact, the Old Testament is, is like a book of laws. Some scholars say it's, it has like 300 laws. Some people say almost 600 laws in there. So the Ten Commandments, if you like, a condensed version of all these commandments. Hallelujah. I mean, th some of these laws, they, 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 they don't apply to us now, but they were just ridiculous laws. So, uh, somewhere like you, you had to be circumcised, it, obviously a man. Um, uh, some of the other laws were to do with covenants. Some of those do with uh, sh shedding blood. You know, blood had to, something, life had to be paid for, for some things. And uh, other laws were to do with things. Some animals you're not supposed to eat because they're this, and some plants you can't eat. All sorts of laws. Let's say 600 laws. There are so many laws in there, it's just ridiculous. But James 2.10, I think it's James 2.10, 2, it says, for whosoever shall keep all the laws and yet offend in one, in one point, he, has, he is guilty of all. So you, let's say there are 300 laws and you keep the 299 but you break one. He says you have broken all of them. And it's not just the actions of, you know, but, but, but it's just the, the intents and the mind and the thoughts. So it's fair to say that keeping the law was really, really difficult, almost impossible. Now, in regards to the law, uh, let me show you how, how the mind works in regards to the law. Hallelujah. So laws are either accompanied by a punishment or a reward. Okay, um, for example, a law, which, let, let's take for that one, no admission during service times. And you say, if, if you do, you'll be thrown out. That's a law with a punishment. But if I say no admission during service times, no, if you don't go there during service times, I'll reward you with a cup of tea. That's a law as well but with the reward. Hallelujah. Now, the, the way the mind works in regards to law is this. Your reaction to the law is shaped by the condition that's attached to the law. So usually when a law is followed by a punishment, the mind tends to rebel. Whereas if it's a reward, I mean, you can see that classic with kids. If you tell them to do something, 
they would do it. If you say, if you don't do it, I'll give you this. This is how the mind works. Hallelujah. Now, I've realized that the problem is actually not nothing to do with the law, with the content of the law. But the problem is being told what to do. The Bible says, a mind controlled by flesh is hostile to God. Hallelujah. Now, this is where small th something small called an ego comes in. Now, an e everyone has an ego. An ego is a brilliant thing to have. It's good. When you hear someone who's egotistical, people confuse them for someone who's arrogant. That's wrong. There's a difference. Ego is good. Ego is that I is the self. You know yourself. Whereas with arrogance, you usually with people who are arrogant, they usually they have extremely low self-esteem. And very little awareness of their ego. So them being arrogant is trying to cover up for, for the deficit that they, they lack to bridge the gap, if you like. <laughs> Hallelujah. But the ego is that I wish I was eloquent as pasta. It's like I have it in my mind. I don't know how to say. It's uh, so you know what you're capable of. It's like you, you, if desire knows it's good at keys, he doesn't need to broadcast it. Inside him, he knows what he's capable of. He knows the limit and is comfortable with that. But with arrogance, you want to... So this one saying ego is good. Ego is good because it protects us from being abused and misused. Because you know what you're capable of. You know what you bring to the table. You can't be misused or abused. Recently, some, a, a, a young lady posted something on, on, on Twitter which made me think. She, she posted a, a, a broken table, like a table with, without any legs on it, holes in it. And then, and then she put a caption. And basically, what, what she means is, you know when the guy falls in love or wants to marry a woman, and then, then he calls this crunch talk. So, you know, we have to sit, you have to sit and talk and see what she brings to the table. So this guy was saying, this is the table, the broken table that these men talk about. <laughs> it, it's actually broken, by, but they talk about why you bring it to the table. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, so, the, so the ego makes you a way of who you are, what you can do. And you are aware of what you can do and you're comfortable with that. So that's why the ego is good. But here's the thing, the ego craves to be fed. So, so this is how it's fed. Um, for a wise man who wants to walk his way into a, a woman's heart, she'll be really very tough. Everyone thinks she's really tough. A wise man, why he does? He would just say, how do you manage to look beautiful all the time? Just, just, just stuff like that. Your eyes are so expressive, I get lost in them. Your smile is so contagious, I've got the virus. <laughs> I could listen to your voice, it's so soothing all day. And the woman who was really tough is wearing a tough face. And, and she's like, she breaks in, in a smile and, and she's like, stop it. 
but, but what she really means is keep, 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 keep going. And, 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 and for a, woman, a wise woman who wants to get into a man's heart, it's the same. Oh my God, you go to the gym? You look so strong. How old are you? Before he even answers, oh my God, you look very young. And, and, and then the guy starts stroking his beard. Hallelujah. And it's, that is how the ego is fed. For a wise person, they know that. That's what you do. Do you want to get into a, a, a man's pocket? Just, just feed the ego. Just, just say those things. Just say those things. Even if it's a, 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 it, it calls himself like a bad man. You know, you'll be like, you know, I don't really like people, but, you know, you, you, you're good. Because of, of the little compliments you've given him. Hallelujah. This is how the ego works. Now, the ego has one slight problem. There's nothing wrong with feeding the ego. But here's the problem with the ego. It's that very part of us that doesn't want to be told what to do. And what tells us what to do? The law. It's the law that tells us what to do. Especially if you accompany a law with a punishment, what you're going to get is rebellion. Because what the ego is saying, say, don't go into there during service times or we'll kick you out. They say, who, who are you? Tell, I know who I am. You, you're telling me what to do and you're threatening me. You, you think I'm scared? You think I'm a chicken? Do you know what? I'll just go and do exactly what you don't want me to do. That's the ego. When you see f from a very young age, the kids. There's one time my wife told this little alien, take your shoes to, to, to the corridor. He said, no. The ego. We, everyone, kids, grown, and not just kids. And the men, grown-ups. Yes. Like, in my mind at home, I'm, I'm a very good husband. I do work at home. In my mind, I'm planning. <laughs> I'll be planning. I'm, I'm going to cook. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wash dishes. In my mind, I'm planning. Let me finish this reading this. I'm going to do it. Just before I do, if my wife comes and says, could you cook or could you do, guess what I'm not going to do? I'm not touching it because I'm being told now what to do. Now, ask all the wives and ask about their husbands. We don't want to be told what to do. When, when I was young, you've been, you've been in the house and my mom would be in, in the next room and she'd be like, whoever's there, please come. Oh my God. And everyone would just shut up. No, we, we don't want to be told what to do. Have, have you come across the, the wet, do, do, are you familiar with the wet syndrome, um, wet pain syndrome? Do you know when it's like, wet pain, do not touch. They'll touch it. You could be in the same room with someone, you're both on your phones, but let someone say, oh, oh don't look. What are they going to do? We have a meeting. Please don't bring kids in the meeting. I'll just leave that there. Don't pack on a double yellow line. And they're making millions every day. It's being told what to do and being threatened with consequences of punishment. This is the problem with, with the ego. Hallelujah. Now, Romans 8, 7. Now I'm going to get into the word. The mind governed by flesh is hostile to God. So that's why the more God told the children of Israel, stop grumbling and complaining. 
The more he said them, the more they became rebellious. God puts, God puts Adam and Eve in, a, in, a, in the garden Eden and say, of all these trees you can eat, but this you can't eat. The very tree said, don't eat from this. It's the very tree. Because say, if you eat from it, you, you, know, you, would, you would die. There is a law and being threatened with a punishment. See, the ego is, is your enemy until it becomes your friend. It's your enemy until it becomes your friend. Like with everything, there's good and bad bits about it. But how did we get to this? What, why the law? What, if, if, if the law is just disrupting our being, why? How did we get to this? That's the question on, on my title, my summer. So, so when the law arrived, sin became alive. Because you don't know what's wrong until right's been shown. So law is that moral compass. Law tells you what to do and what not to do. Romans 5.20. I, I like the message because it's so like Lehman's English. The way it's 5.20 says, all that passing laws did was produce more lawbreakers. Romans 5.20. Uh, I prefer the message you have. All that passing laws did was produce more lawbreakers. So does that mean law is bad? Does it actually increase sin? So if so, so why, why, why do we have the law? If it causes all this, this havoc. So my main scripture is going to be in uh, uh, Romans 7.7. 7. So I want us to decipher why, what's the point of law? If it cause, if, 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 if saying, you know, if it's causing all this sin, why did it come in the first place? Because before we go into the grace, I, I need us to be on the same page in regards to law, the law. But I can hear you say, if the law code was as bad as all that, it's not better than sin itself. I say, that's certainly not true. The law code had a perfectly legitimate function. And without its clear guidance for the right or wrong, moral behavior would be mostly guesswork. He's saying without the law, we wouldn't know what's moral and what's not. Apart from the succinct surgical command, you shall not covet, I could have dressed covetousness up to look like a virtue and ruined my life with it. Without law, I, even the queer gone by, I could have used the Quegomba as a good thing. But law came. Being proud of that. But when the law came, I said, no, 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 no. That is wrong. So the law is good and is from God. Keep going, please. Don't you remember how it was? And I like the way you break down and say, I do. Perfectly well. This is how it was. So the law code started as an excellent piece of work. What happened though was that sin found its way. Found a way to pervert the command into a temptation. Making a piece of forbidden fruit out of it. Right. Are we following? So the law code, instead of being used to guide me, was used to seduce me. Without all the paraphernalia of the law code, sin looked pretty dull and lifeless. Let's keep going. And I went along with it without paying much attention to it. But once sin got its hands on the law cord and decked itself out in that finery, I was fooled and fell for it. Keep going. 
the very command that was supposed to guide me into life was cleverly used to trip me up, throwing me headlong, head fast. So sin was plenty alive and I was stone dead. But the law called itself is God's good and common sense. Each command, sin and holy counsel. He's saying the law was good. But this is what sin does. When sin comes, it gets the, the law and wraps himself into the law. So on top you see the law, but inside there is sin. You see the example I gave you about the ego perceiving that as I'm being told what to do. When you see a command, a law, this is what sin does. It makes that command tempting to you. It makes a forbidden fruit of it. And the command starts seducing you. For example, if someone says, I put money there, don't steal it. If you steal it, uh, uh, I don't know, I'll, I'll put you on a naughty step. What sin does, it turns that command into, so that money, now sin flips the thing around and you're being seduced by the money. And you're like, I, I could actually, because someone's saying, don't take the law. Sin is saying, now they've put a thought in your mind that you can actually steal it. So you look at it and it's so seducing. This is what sin did. And it says, it clothed itself in the law with all that fine, you know, all that, or, or, you know, is it, is it par, par, for, yeah, paraphernalia. So here's the law on top, underneath there is sin. And that messed up God. He's just angry. So this is why he did. Actually, before I get to that, I, I, the, the, just just one thing, just to ex, to explain the law. So, so the law was intended to to show what sin is, show us the extent of sin, to expose men to their guilt and make them conscious of sin. The law itself did not increase sin. It didn't decrease lawbreakers. It's the sin that came and manipulated the law and sabotaged it and clothed itself as the law, but it was actually sin. I'll give you an example of, um, has everyone been to a nightclub? Oh, it's just me then. Child is so born again. When, a long time ago when, when I used to have hair, I used to go out clubbing. Now, if you've been to a nightclub, the lights in the nightclub are usually, the, you know the pink lights, a bit dim? You can just about see, but you can't see. You go in there, just people drunk, married men with young girls, married women with boys, people are drunk, they're vomiting. Some women are just complaining, guys are just touching them inappropriately. It was all going on. But with the dim purple lights, you can't see what's going on underneath. Do you know what's the thing about that purple light? Even wearing a dirty shirt, it shows us very, very clean. Clean is so white. You'd think you just used Omo before coming to the club. You look at the, if there is a, what's that paper they put on the wall? Wallpaper. It all looks really, really, because of the purple light. So that's the world. The world was like that. But then when five o'clock, when they're closing, the proper lights come on. Those lights, that's the law. So sin was going on unnoticed. But when they switched off the lights, then you see people were vomiting, people were fighting, people were can't stand people touching all, all, all sorts of sin in the very place that you didn't know. So that's when law came. 
It's like we, we had a new pair of glasses so we can see properly what was going on. The fact that I was exposed to what was going on doesn't mean the light increased what was going on. Now the light is the law. I want you to keep that in mind. Hallelujah. So sin dressed itself in law and disguise. So what God did, God saw this sin manipul using the law, his law. And he said, all right, I'm also going to dress myself into Jesus and come down. So on top, it was Jesus against the law, as in grace against the law, but underneath it was God versus sin. He came to take it away. Now, but could you go to 13, please? I can already hear your next question. Does that mean I can't even trust what is good? That is the law. Is good just as dangerous as evil? No. Again. You see, sin simply did what sin is so famous for doing. Using the good as a cover to tempt me to do what would finally destroy me. By hiding within God's good commandment, sin did far more mischief than it could ever have accomplished. This was like the Romeo and Juliet drama all over again. Where is it Juliet fell in love with the with with, with with Romeo and then they were separate because the dad didn't want him to marry Romeo and then they were married. And so she thought, she thought of a plan to bring uh, to reunite herself with Romeo. So she faked her death. She died and sent a word to Romeo. And Romeo came to the tomb. Saw her lying there. He hadn't got the message that she's faking her death. So he wanted to die with her beloved. So he died. And when he died, then she woke up. And she realized he was dead. And then she died herself as well. The chaos, the drama. The Bible says, man was alive. Sin was dead. Like in a nightclub. Sin wasn't dead. Sin was going on. But man wasn't aware. The lights were not switched on. But then God sent the law. Moses came with the law. The law opened us our eyes. And now because the law condemned us to death. So man died. Now sin became alive. And that's when God sent the grace. So the sin now which is alive died. And now we are alive again. The chaos. Hallelujah. But this is God's plan. This is like the center of my message today. This is the real plan. How we got here. Romans 5.13, if you may. It says, sin disturbed relations with God in everything and everyone. But the extent of the disturbance wasn't clear until God spelled it out in detail to Moses. What sin is doing, turning his law into a bad thing. And he calls Moses. He's like, I need a righteous man. Moses was a man of God. Not this man of God prophesy, man of God. He was a man of God. The Bible says Moses had spoken face to face with God as a friend. Moses, when he was young, he was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. So Pharaoh became the father of Moses. Hebrews 11.24 Please go there if you can. 11, it says 
when Moses grew up, he refused. He refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Yeah, by faith Moses, when grown, refused to be, refused the privileges of the Egyptian royal house. Please go on. There's a reason why he refused. I want to guess. He chose a hard life with God's people rather than an opportunistic soft life of sin with the oppressors. He valued suffering in the Messiah's camp far greater than Egyptian wealth because he was looking ahead, anticipating the payoff. By an act of faith, he turned his heel on Egypt, indifferent to the king's blind rage. He had his eye on the one no eye can see. And kept right going on. He refused, turned down all the privileges because he had seen the invisible one. He had got a revelation of God. So Moses was a man of God. So God calls him in his office. Moses comes. And goes like, close the door behind you and sits down. And goes like, I see what sin is doing. He's like, I need to save my people. And he's like, I'm going to cut a deal with you. See, I could have done it all by myself, but I want, I want to let you in the loop. In the loop of what I'm doing. So God gives the law to Moses. The law is not Moses's. The law is God's. Moses was used as a a vessel, a middleman to deliver us to his people. Because he said, if you take this law to them, they are dying, but they don't know. They are not conscious of their sin. They're just doing all sorts. So it's like, take this law to them. This is the God's plan. He says, take this law to them. Let the law open their eyes to the chaos, to the danger they are in. It's because you see that the only, the only good thing about death, there's one thing I've found, I haven't found any other good reasons about death. When someone dies, when death occurs, it makes you appreciate and, and value life more. I've worked with people who are addicted to all sorts of substances. They're injecting all things, places I can't even say. And they know, and then they just keep doing it, they keep doing it. They've tried all therapy or everything, nothing's worked. But the moment a close, a close friend dies, I've seen when someone say, I'm not doing that anymore. Because that death opened their eyes to the reality of actually this is, this is the danger we're in. I'll give you an example. To, in order to know wealth, you have to know poverty. In order to know what victory is, you have to experience a loss. You have to have knowledge of uh, loss. In order to know bad, to know good, you have to know bad. So God gives his law to Moses to expose the bad to us because he had a plan. The dying of Jesus was the end of God's plan. God's plan had two 
two items in there. Moses has got to do, take the law to them so that know so they know what danger they're in. Because once you know what danger you're in, when a savior comes, you will know that you've been saved. Yeah. If he just sent Jesus, we wouldn't value it. The reason why diamonds are more valuable than water is because water is everywhere. There's a shortage of diamonds. When something is difficult to get, you start valuing it. He thought, I could just send Jesus. I could just go down and save these people. But they won't get a revelation of what I've done for them. That's why the law came. Hallelujah. Now, when Jesus came, no, so, so God, the law of Moses was like a, God gave the law to Moses and, and Moses is a re representation of the law and that's why he never made it to the promised land. Because He's saying the law can't get you to the promised land. It only reveals how unworthy you were to know that you need saving. Without the law, you can't call Jesus a savior. What would be saving you from? You would know that he has saved you. Hallelujah. And that's where the grace comes in. The Bible says, where sin abound, grace abound even more. That's just ridiculous. Where there's more sin, God said, I'll just pour them more. I'll just outpour the sin with my grace. Grace to me is just simply love. Hallelujah. Now, grace and mercy are usually like twin walls, they were used interchangeably or close to each other. They are so similar but very different. Mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. Whereas grace is when you get what you don't deserve. Is that confusing? Mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. Grace is when you get what you don't deserve. If there's a law at home for Elion, he knows where the toilet is. If he wants to do wee wee, he goes to the toilet. If he breaks the law and wets his trousers, he knows that breaking the law is punishable. Now, I'm not going to tell you what I'd do to him, but he's punished. Let's say Elion wets his trousers. He breaks the law. Now I need to punish him. But that's the conditions attached to the law. But then I decide not to punish him. Mercy. He doesn't get what he deserves. Punishment is what you deserve. So God doesn't stop there. I am God in this example. Not only do I not give him what he deserves, I say, come here. And I give him a, a big cuddle. And I give him a, a sweet or a chocolate. And he said, you know what? You're a good boy. You're a good boy. That was a mistake, but I know you. I believe in you, you're a good boy. That will probably leave more of an impact. Than me beating him. Him getting a sweet from me. That is grace. Now he's getting what he doesn't deserve. 
God could have just forgiven us mercy and left it there. But he said, nah, grace, I'll give them a new life. Adam and Eve, when they ate the forbidden fruit and they were hiding in the garden and they covered themselves with, with leaves, the Bible said God came and calling and then realized they're covering them with, themselves with leaves. And he's, why he did, he comes and covers them with skins of animals, saying to them like, your works, your works, they do not save you. It says, it's only the grace of God that covers you. And not only that, it shows them that there is grace. Blood has been shed. Because animal skin doesn't go on trees. Something has lost a life. Genesis 2.17, God tells Adam, said, the moment you eat from the tree of life, you will die. He said, it's a, no, no, say, say, in the day you eat from, from the tree of life, you, you will die. But when you read the Bible, Adam lived up to, I say, 130 years and had a had a son, was he Seth? Had a son, and then he lived another eight hundred years because he died when he was nine nine hundred and thirty. The grace of God. But check this out. When I realized this, I was just blown away. So the word of God came to pass, but grace squeezed himself into there. Moses, so sorry, Adam died. In the day he ate the fruit, as God had said, although he lived 930 years. The Bible says one day. In heaven, is like a thousand years here. So, if he died at 930, had he died when he was 1,000 years old, that means the word would be after the day you eat from this tree, you will die. So when it says in the day you eat, it says before this day ends, you will die. In other words, grace just flipped the years from earthly years to heavenly years. <laughs> and he actually died in the day before he, before he, he clocked 1,000 years. The grace of God. Let me share the grace. I, I realize it has two types. There's one grace for all and then there's grace for you and I the salvation for new life there's grace for all where even the devil gets the grace even Satan gets the grace I don't know where the scripture is when Jesus is walking and there are two men who are demon possessed and they come to him does anyone know where the scripture is and they come to him and they say what do you need from Why are you charging from us? It's not our time yet. It's not our time. Now they know what he's going to do. But I say, okay, okay, okay. Before you cast us, if you're going to cast us, can you please cast us into the pigs? And what does God do? And he grants them their request. The demons? The grace of God.
there is there is a scripture when Satan goes to God and say, you know what, Adam really, Job really loves you because you gave him all the money and the riches and that's why. But if you give him to me one, just one day, I'll take it all the way. See if he will love you. And God, what, what does he do? He says, okay, you can have him. Take it away. Take away everything. He's almost negotiating with the devil. The grace for all. This grace for all is for all creations, plants, humans. Do you know how many buses or trains you've bought it? And there's some guy with a gun or with a knife on going to murder someone else. Our kids cross roads to and from school every day. The grace of God. The flats we live in, these this, 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 this flats, um, what are they called? Estates, are full of pedophiles and murderers and, and, and people of killed and, and all sorts of paths. And we, we share flats and communion with them, but, but what protects us? The grace of God. Every day, hallelujah. Romans um, eleven twenty nine says, the, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. It says, I don't, I don't regret the gift I give you. I don't care if you're using it to serve other gods. I am not repentant. I give with grace. I give it to you. He says he doesn't apologize, nor does he regret why he gave you. Even if you choose to use it for other gods, the grace of God. The true definition of grace to me is love. And no wonder he proves his, his grace, no, no, his love by his company. You know, show me who you spend more time with and I'll show you someone you love. Company, being with someone, if you needed proof, that's proof that you love them. Hallelujah. Children of Israel, he was with them. There was a, there was a, what's it called? A, a fire, yeah, a fire walking with them. All the time. Because he was in love with them. He says, Pastor, you mentioned it this morning. When you go through the waters, I have the ability to stop the waters so you can walk out. But no, I'll come in with you. Because he proves his love by his company with us. He says, when the rivers flow, you won't be swept away because I am. When, you, when the three guys were thrown into the fire, God could just stop the fire. He could have stopped, just stopped the fire from burning them. But he joined them in there. The Bible says when they came out of the fire, they were inspected by some of the governors of, you know. And they said, even one, not one single hair from their head was burnt. The Bible says, they didn't even smell of smoke. He's saying, the, the fire, yeah, yeah, that, that will come, but I'll be with you in the fire. And when you come out of whatever problem you're coming out of, people won't tell you that you have been in through that by the scars you have. You won't even smell the problems. Should we please go to uh, Jeremiah 31, 31, 34. I feel it's important for us to get this, the, the old covenant, get the verses, the New Testament to understand the God, the, the God of grace. Um, Jeremiah 31, 31. It says, 31, 31, please. So that's what, the time is coming when I'll make a brand new covenant with Israel and Judah. Yes. I won't be a rep it won't be a repeat of the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took their hand to lead them out of Egypt. 
They broke that covenant even though I did my part as their master. It says in the, keep going, it says in the Old Testament, I took you by the hand in marriage. We were in a marriage, but you walked away. You divorced me. But he says, now this is the new, this is what I want in the new covenant. He says, this is the brand new covenant that I'll make with Israel when the time comes. I'll put my law within them, write it on their hearts, and be their God. They will be my people. Keep going. They will no longer, I love this, they will no longer go around setting up schools to teach others about God. They will know me firsthand. Because he's with us. He's with you. It doesn't make sense going to someone to teach you about something that's in sin, inside of you. He said, the dull, the bright, the smart, the slow, I'll wipe the slate clean for each of them. I'll forget they ever sinned. I don't care if you're smart or if you're not. If you say, let me in. I'll come and be with you. I'll teach you. And you know me firsthand. You won't just be calling God the God of Abraham and, and Jacob and Isaac. You'll be the God of Diana. You'll be the God of Ronnie. You'll be the, because you know me firsthand. You won't need anyone to teach you about me. I will, because I'll be with you. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Leave is just to temporarily remove yourself. Whereas forsake is to do with the mind. It's permanent. Because once someone has been removed from your mind, you've forsaken them. They say, I'll never leave you, nor forsake you. And no wonder God's standard for those who have fallen, is, he measures it with love. He's not saying if you sin or if you kill, if you do this, you have fallen. No. He measures it with love because he knows when you get, by the time you get to that point, Love is not there. This scripture just blew my mind. I'm about to finish. Uh, Revelation 2, 2, 7. Revelation 2, 2, 7. Uh, 2, 2. Sorry, uh, Revelation 2, yes, uh, no, uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 2, I think, I just want to share this, this uh, the way he measures those who have fallen is by love, love is the, the scale on which he measures those who have fallen, thanks so much, he said, I see what you've done, your hard work, Hard, hard work. Your refusal to quit. I know you can't stomach evil. That you weed out apostolic pretenders. I know your persistence, your courage in my cause, and that you never wear out. But this is the scripture. It says, but you walked away from your first love. Why? What's going on with you anyway? You say, you say, you you do what you say you're going to do. You attend meetings, you attend rehearsals, you give in charge. You say, I don't doubt your efforts. Even when things are difficult on your side, you never give up. You say, I'm not saying you're sleeping around. I'm not saying you're a liar. He says, you have fallen a Lucifer fall because you walked away from the first love. Hallelujah. Do you remember when you just fell in love and you were zealous and nothing could get in the way of you praying and the fasting and they couldn't help to tell others about God? Do you 
you remember that the, the, the zeal that you had when you fell in love? He said you walked away from that. But then I was confused when I read this. He says, I was like, you're religious. You, you, you automatize. You just work. You just do all this because it's duty. That's not what I want. He says, it's not bad, but what I'm really after is the love. Hallelujah. What was confusing is when I read it, and then I said, if you, if you, if you go to the next chapter, it says, do you, have an, do you have an idea how far you've fallen? A Lucifer fall, because you're working from the first love. He said, turn back, recover your dear early love. No time to waste, for I'm well on my way to removing your light from the golden circle. When I read this, I thought, so he's saying I should go back to the zeal, the time I had for him, when nothing could get away, when I couldn't wait to share God with others. So he's telling me to go back to that. But then I was confused because it didn't make sense. Because I thought, if that's what he really means, then he's saying, you know, if you don't do it, I'll take away your life. It's like, you have to put in more efforts to do what you used to do, which is works. As in, if I don't put in the work, you won't save me. But that's not the grace we've just talked about. So it left me confused. Is that first love when I first fell in love with him, is that really the first love? I'll into, into a marriage with, with, with my wife. So, so now, now and then when I compare, was that love? I'm not really sure. Is it love now? A hundred percent. I realized that at the beginning I was infatuated. I was smitten. I was crushing on her. There was a bit of lust in there. Did I love her? Now that I know love, I don't think so. See, I was, what I'm trying to say is, the way I was reading this is with the lens of the law. Because I'm thinking, oh, he's saying if I don't get back to the way I love him, he's going to remove my lampstand, he's going to take away my job, he's going to take away my family. That's the law, that's not grace. So then I, I thought, okay, I've, I think I've totally misunderstood what the first love is. So I had to put on my lenses of grace and read the scripture again. Do you remember the first time you fell in love with God? It's because you had got a revelation of God's love for you. Does that make sense? You knew what he had done to save you, so you fell in love with him. He initiated the love and you responded. So here we have two types of love. Now if you do maths, I think your love for him is the second love. But his love for you, that is the first love he's talking about. He said, return to the first love. Return to the revelation you got of my love for you. Because everything begins with love. A revelation, when you have a revelation of God's love for you, you don't need a pastor to call you to come and repent. He's your beloved, you know. It's the revelation of God's love for you that cuts away fear. It is the source of unexplainable joy, peace, and confidence in all situations because you know he loves you. 
The Bible says the reason why we love is because he loved us. The first love. We love because he has loved us. A Christian who has a revelation of God's love for him is a very dangerous Christian to the enemy because whatever is thrown at them They know, they know there's a reason for it. But the one who loves them will find a way for them. The Bible says, perfect love casts away fear. Don't you know that love is to fear what light is to darkness. That in the presence of one, the other disappears. When you know you're loved by God, everything starts from there. You have a good sense of your self-worth. Even when you toss to and fro, you know there's a plan. A Christian with a revelation of the love of God won't even fear witchcraft or magic charm. Because you know that he will turn that curse into a blessing. A Christian who has a revelation of the love of Christ won't even spend time praying for blessing. Because he knows he's already been blessed. Rather play for that to be revealed to you. So you walk in them. He's saying the works, all this, the praying is all good. But I don't give you what I give you. Because you do that. It's not about what you do for me. It's about my love for you. Praying is brilliant. Fasting is brilliant. But he's saying, you know that thing you prayed for? I didn't give it to you because you prayed for it. Why? Because there are some of the things that you prayed even harder for, but you never got. So that means it's not down to your prayers. It's down to my love for you. Hallelujah. When you have a revelation of God's love for you, you know that he can't love you and not protect you. He can't love you and not heal you. He can't love you and not give you peace and joy. So what separated you from the love of God? Is it hatred? Was it trouble? Was it hard times? Can we just end with a scripture that pastor ended with? Romans 8.35 What is that that separated you from the revelation of the love of God? Romans 8.35 Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? No way. No trouble, no hard times, no hatred, no hunger, no homelessness, not bullying threats, no backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in scripture. Keep going. Keep going, please. And keep going. Got 37. None of this physics. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love. Because of the way that Jesus, our master, has embraced us, he says, the one who died for us right now as I speak is with God sticking up for us. Hallelujah. That is the love of God. Father God, I pray that we open our hearts and souls to, to the first love. 
not our love for you, but your love for us. Because with that love, with the knowledge of that love, we are confident, we are fearless. Whatever comes our way, when we know the one who loves us, we know he can't let us suffer with no fruit at the end of it. But I pray to each and every saint in this house today that you may return us to the first love. Where our efforts don't count, where our sweats and don't reward us, but the grace of God. Thank you, Jesus.